Okay, so I have Alyssa Goldwater here for part two. Hi, Alyssa. How are you? Hi, I'm so happy to be back. Part one yeah. was fun. Yeah, it was really fun. And we covered a lot of ground. And as, as I was saying before, we started recording that I already listened to that twice. Um, it was so filled with information and just like really, it was fun to listen to and it was interesting. And a few things that I just wanted to like unpack because it was like, there was so much information there. Um, so I wanted to talk about a few things, but um, first, I guess I'll start with your sort of like your story about like growing up in a house that like speaking about your feelings wasn't done, like how that affected you and how that sort of like affects you now. Sure. So yeah, when my mom passed away, when I was nine, we just, I think my dad sort of followed my lead um, and I just wasn't interested in talking about it. I don't really know what nine-year-old um, is interested in unloading feelings that they probably can't even make sense of. So I think that's totally normal. Um, but, you know, we just didn't really talk about our feelings to this day. I don't get like mushy gushy with my dad. Um, actually, it was funny. We went to, we went to Disney world a couple of weeks ago. And one of the only vivid memories I have of my mother is when we went to Disney world. Um, so, you know, obviously going back there, it's been like over 20 years taking my kids. I was like feeling emotions and I'm like aware of myself now. Like I cried on, it's a small world, <laughs> like, um, all the things. And I, said something to my dad about it. And he was like, <laughs> I can't talk right now. Oh. Um, I, and I got off the phone and I said to my husband, I'm like, no wonder. <laughs> right. <laughs> like, right. I love my dad so much. And I don't think he'll ever listen to this because he probably won't know it exists, but um, like nothing against him. He just like, we just didn't feel our feelings and he wanted me to feel mine because he put me in therapy for many, many years um, where I would, you know, end up playing Jenga for an hour or walking the therapist's dog with her. So like, I just didn't, I never found the right therapist to help me like feel those feelings in like a safe, comfortable place because they're really heavy feelings. And even today, um, it's uncomfortable for me to sit there and like feel those feelings. It's not comfortable. Um, so I think, I don't know how much therapy we could have avoided if I, <laughs> if we had been a little bit more open back then, but um, I certainly, you know, um, treat feelings in my own family today differently than they were treated in mine because I never want my kids to feel like they can't share a feeling or that feelings are bad. Um, and also, you know, sometimes, sometimes mommy cries and it's okay for mommy to be sad and mommy's okay. And sometimes you're sad too, and that's okay. And, um, we just feel all of the feelings in our house and, um, I'm just hoping to listen, I hope nothing traumatic ever happens to my children. Um, but even just feelings in general and being like well-rounded people, I really hope that by being so open about it in our family, it will really help my kids, um, you know, mature and like down the line when they have their own families also. Um, my, it's funny because I really only came into my own emotions as an adult, um, you know, recognizing them and feeling them and knowing that it was okay. But my six-year-old Miri, who is literally my twin in pretty much every single way, is learning to feel her feelings as a six-year-old and is very mature. Um, so it's just funny. We feel feelings in a very similar way. Um, and it's just funny because I'm like, I'm 30 and I'm looking at her and she's doing it when she's six. And clearly that's a sign of success. Um, but it's also 
a funny like world to live in where your six-year-old is feeling emotions that you didn't even know existed until you were like 28. So, right. right. Um, yeah. But would do you think like looking back on, I guess, like your nine-year-old self, like, and, and your dad, do you think that that was more like the culture that there was no, like, like people didn't feel their feelings or, or share their feelings as much? Or do you think it was like the lack of like, you know, the mother figure in your home? Like, what do you, what do you think it was? I think it's definitely my dad's like personality. Um, my aunt, um, my mother's sister, who I'm still very close to, and my father is still very close to, um, always felt all the feelings, but maybe not in like the healthiest way. Like she would just cry at the touch of anything. Right. Um, and it always made me feel incredibly uncomfortable. Um, I don't know. I think I do think there was a cultural aspect to it. Um, it just wasn't talk. It just wasn't, you just didn't talk about it. Right. Um, everyone just avoided that topic of mother at all costs. And I, in fact, would have such anxiety that when I would speak to someone new or like someone I hadn't spoken to in a while, they would forget. And then like, they would bring it up or say like your mother and father, or like your, you know, your parents, um, it was like so anxiety provoking to me that it would even just be brought up. Um, and I wouldn't know what to do about it. Um, so I, it like, had to, it had to be cultural, you know? Right. Right. So you mean like nobody even spoke about the fact that your mom died? Like nobody even said like, how are you doing? Like, how are you feeling? No. So I think people also took the lead from me. I definitely didn't want to talk about it. You know, at school, um, I was in fourth grade. I remember the teacher I actually went to school the day after she passed away. I didn't want anything to be different. Um, and I remember the teacher brought, you know, the girls out in the hall first and then the boys out in the hall. And we would, I didn't go to um, a Jewish school growing up. Um, and, you know, they all came to the Shiva party that we had. Um, but after that, no, we didn't, no, no, nobody ever asked me how I was doing, but I think that would have been horrible for me, for somebody to ask me that. I just had no idea how to process any of it. Um, it's so sad talking about it now. Um, I feel bad for myself. Right. Um, and I've come to a place where I feel okay feeling a little bad for my younger self. Right. Um, it's just really sad. I just, I never want, that's why, you know, I think that organizations like Lynx is, are just so, in, Lynx is really one of a kind, but I think it's so incredible because I did a live with them um, last week about, you know, yard sites and whatever. And I just, I never want another child to have to go through what I've been through. Um, so sad. Yeah to just hold all of that for so, so long. Yeah. Um, and even now, I think I maybe mentioned it. It's like, it's uncomfortable for me to sit with those feelings still, but I know it's important and I know that it's okay. Right. Um, right. So we're getting somewhere. Yeah. It's funny because you're using the word like uncomfortable. Like, I don't think anyone likes to sit in uncomfortable uh, feelings, but I think like, I, I guess like, I don't know. I, I think it must be somewhat cultural or somewhat like some of us are just, we can't stand not having the tools to deal with strong, strong, uncomfortable emotions. Cause that's just part of life. Yeah. But like, I don't think anybody likes sitting in the discomfort. It's just like to even name it, like, wow, this is like really painful or uncomfortable is like a skill, like a tool that a lot of us. Well, right. Have. So I also think I'm able to do this now because I can't remember if I mentioned in our last podcast that I went to an intensive outpatient therapy program. So you, you didn't mention it. And I was like, we said, before I, we started recording that you were on 
uh, Riff Gee's podcast today on impact fashion. And I just happened to listen to it because I listen usually every Monday. And I was like, oh, that's so funny. I'm going to be interviewing you later. And I was like, what? I never saw this. I don't, I'm not always on Instagram. I miss things on yeah, Instagram. So, so like, yeah, tell us about that. So in February of 2021, um, right after my son was diagnosed with type one diabetes, there was just a lot going on. Obviously I hadn't really handled any of my like lost mother trauma emotions. And, you know, we met our copay very early in, in our deductible very early in the year. Um, so it would be covered by insurance. And my husband and I just decided that it could be a good time for me to do this for myself. So I went for 40 days. Um, it was every day from 8.30 to 2.30 in the afternoon. Um, and I just sat, it was a trauma track. Um, and Can you I tell learned, us what it, what, what's it called, what it is, sure. how you so found it's called, it. Com- it's called Compass Healthcare. Um, they have a few locations throughout the Chicagoland area. I went to the one in Northbrook, Illinois, for those of you listening who are local to Chicago. Um, and there are different um, tracks of the program, you know, like regular mood disorders, there's a youth and adolescent program, then there's a trauma track um, for people who have like dealt with trauma in their lives. So I did that track. Um, And we basically just, it was group therapy for like six hours a day, which I had never done anything like group therapy before. And now I think it's the most incredible thing in the entire world. And I'm such an advocate. And I've been looking actually for groups um, for myself since I've left Compass and they're so hard to find like the right one. And I actually wish there were more in the From community. Um, There's a great new organization. I'll just give them a plug called Catch Support in New York. Have you heard of them? Yeah. I yeah, so I interviewed like, Jessica here on the podcast. So. Oh, you did? So like yeah. totally an incredible organization where they are in the from community for women and offering um, group support, which I think is incredible. But um, basically in Compass, I learned skills for how to access my emotions and also to feel them and um, to be able to tolerate the discomfort that would come with feeling those emotions. Um, so there was one skill that we learned there called ride the wave. Actually, I have a graphic. I printed it out. Um, and basically what it means, it, and I'm no doctor, um, just so we're just clear. Yeah. Here. <laughs> but um, basically it's like the wave of emotion is like a bell curve and from peak to peak, you know, really an intense emotion should last like 15 to 30 minutes at most. And like, you just have to continue to tell yourself like it's going to end, it's going to end. And there are skills that I learned um, to help get from, you know, the two peaks of that wave. Um, of emotion and you're supposed to ride the wave rather than jump off the wave Mm -hmm. because if you don't ride the wave and feel your emotions and jump off they're likely going to come back and it's going to be an even bigger wave than before Um, so that's really one of the most integral skills that I learned there and I you know it's not always easy to access the skills to help you ride that wave um but that, that program changed my life. It changed the way I parent and I'm not embarrassed that I went um, and I've gotten other people to go. Um, I just think if you have the opportunity, I would go there every day. <laughs> it made me feel so good about myself. Yeah, totally. Um, it just is like a really, it's a hard place, but it's a really good place. Um, And I think if once a week therapy isn't helping you um, and you are able to do something where you can really like hyper focus for a little while, then I just think it's invaluable. Um, And I'm so glad that I did it. So it sounds like, uh, correct me if I'm wrong, but it sounds like, was that like something that you were thinking about doing for a while? Like you were looking, like what triggered, what, what made you think like, hey, now I need more support? 
So it had come up a couple of times, um, but it always seemed impossible to do. You know, what am I going to do with the kids? You know, I have a job. Um, But after Ozzy was diagnosed with diabetes, it sort of put me over the edge. I was like, so beyond overwhelmed. I, I was sleeping in his bed every night. I was like, up all night. I just, it was just like too much. Mm -hmm. Um, and I couldn't handle it. And so we decided that, you know, even Adam would take over, um, talking to the teachers about his, you know, insulin and stuff while I was there. Um, thank God my husband, well, not think, I mean, whatever. My husband also has type one diabetes, Baruch Hashem. And um, so he's very capable, right. um, which is a huge, thank God, because yeah. I'm not in it, I'm not doing it alone. Um, I have a very capable, even probably more capable partner who helps manage Ozzy, um, my son. But that is sort of what put me, <laughs> that is sort of what put me over the edge. Um, and I'm not sure I could have, we actually just had his first anniversary last week. Mm. Um, and I don't know if the year would have gone the way it did if, um, if I hadn't done the program. So, so you said that your father knew that, um, like, I guess on some level you had to speak to someone, like you went, he put you in therapy, but it was never it wasn't that all that trauma and all that grief and all those years of of unprocessed emotions were sort of like surfacing. Yeah. Like you have to want to be in therapy. Um, you, at least to some extent, and I was so resistant, um, just zero interest, didn't want to talk about anything. Again, like I said, anytime someone would bring up not even my mom, but like talking about moms, I would get anxious and nervous that like, I had this thing where I still do. It's like, um, empathetic embarrassment sort of where like, if somebody else messes up or if somebody else feels uncomfortable, I feel uncomfortable for them, but like it surfaces as like severe discomfort for myself, even though I don't really care. Mm-hmm. I don't care, you know, right. um, it happens when I go to like Broadway shows too. I'm always like a little nervous that the actor is going to mess up. Mm-hmm. I don't know. It's just a weird thing. I hear that. No, I hear um, that. Like, do you hate the movie Meet the Parents? No, why? Because my husband hates that movie because not that he's seen it in many years, but he's like, when other people, you know how it's like super awkward, like everything that happens. Yeah, the whole movie. movie is really awkward. Yeah. But he like can't tolerate it. It's like, he just feels so bad for the main character. <laughs> You know, like that's what's coming to mind for me, but maybe what you're describing is totally That is different. such an old movie. It's bringing me back. Um, yeah, watch it and see. Uh, I'm just joking, but like, I don't want to re-trigger you, but like, that's what, that's what comes to mind for me. Cause he's always like, I can't handle when people are like embarrassed, you know? Like, yeah, no, I think it's more like live discomfort. Like I know they're acting in that movie. Right. But like if someone messes up in a Broadway show, like that was clearly an accident, you know? Um, if someone or, trips or someone's giving a speech and like it's awkward like things right. like that or if somebody like um brings up my mother because they don't know that I don't have one and starts asking questions about her like they're gonna feel really embarrassed and uncomfortable and I feel uncomfortable because they feel uncomfortable mm-hmm. um, it's much better now right. and usually I usually just um if a situation like that comes up, I'm pretty good at like shutting it down sensitive, sensitively and quickly. Um, I've got, I've got my lingo down that I say to people, but, um, as a kid, it was horrible. Mm -hmm. Uh, I mean, it's so interesting because actually I was, I went somewhere with Rachel Tuckman. I'll tell, just make sure she's okay. I know she's really cute. And, and another therapist, Esther Goldstein, Okay. We were out somewhere and I remember bringing up my mom and it was like probably in the first year that she died. 
it was right it was the day of the Kavana conference so maybe it was a year and a half later because she died in September and I remember saying something like yeah it was really hard day like something with my mom sorry to make you uncomfortable and they were like stop apologizing this is like and and actually it gave me like I was like right like I mean I guess like I was an adult when it happened so it's totally different like I could imagine it being like super awkward very hard it is hard but I feel like now when I say like you know my mom died or uh oh yeah like whatever whatever I would say like and people are like oh I'm so sorry I'm like no thank you for like thank you you know like meaning like not that I I do I I feel comfortable talking about it because I feel like like I want to talk about it right some people don't want to talk about it but right as a kid it's like I think that's one of the hardest things about losing a parent as a kid is that unless you have had some like magical upbringing you probably don't know how to access those emotions and you don't know how to feel them. So you just try not to. Right. Um, and right. that's no good. <laughs> and that's probably, that was probably your, your experience for totally. so many years. Right. So many years. So you said like, you didn't find the right therapist till you were 28. So you started, you started back up again in therapy or you were old well, in therapy? Well, I was in, I've been in and out of therapy for a very long time, but yeah, I think I don't know. Yeah. I think I was probably 28, like the year before COVID. Um, gosh, it's been going on for a long yeah. time. Uh, <laughs> I know. I know. Um, but yeah, I've found therapists now that I just, um, and I'll tell you, I was not nearly this emotionally competent until I did compass. Mm-hmm. Um, even with a great therapist that I'm still seeing today, Compass was what really changed me. Um, they just, incredible program. Um, listen, I don't think they fixed my trauma. I don't think that's the point, but right. and I don't even, you know, I don't necessarily always access the tools that I learned there because in the real world, it's very different and harder to do that than when you're sitting in like this safe space where, you know, that's all you're doing. Mm -hmm. But even still, just the fact that I'm emotionally aware and can access my emotions is like one of the greatest gifts anyone could ever give me. Now it's hard when other people around you are not as emotionally aware and competent as you right. are. Right. Um, but you can only control your own reactions. You right. cannot control other people. <laughs> exactly. Um, yeah. So I credit, I really credit most of my like emotional goodness to that program, really. So that that program is literally six hours of sitting in group therapy with the same people and like a facilitator. So you start with six hours and then it goes down to three to four hours. Um, so eventually you're eight thirty to twelve thirty. Um, you're not you're not sleeping there. You said like you're just no no day day you go home. Um, Did you tell your kids about it? I said mommy's going to class, which wasn't a lie. Right. Um, because they were classes and um, I said, mommy's going to class. She's going to learn how to be a better, a better mommy and a better person and um, talk about feelings and totally fine. I mean, all of the teachers knew exactly where I was right. um, and they're like, can I go there too? Right. <laughs> right. No, that's um, amazing. I was very fortunate. It's a very expensive program if your insurance won't cover it. Um, so it was a really great time for me to do it, but I mean, beyond, um, yeah, different facilitators, different topics throughout the day, same group of people for 40 days. Well, it varies based on like what your insurance covers and like how long they think you need to be there, like your progress in the program. But yeah, about four, I was there for 40 days. Uh, it sounds amazing. I would love to go. It's like it was incredible. Yeah. Um, yeah. It was really, really incredible. I'm still in touch with some of you're not like allowed to know anything about the other people in mm-hmm. the group besides their name. Um, oh, really? You're like not supposed to share, but like when you discharge from the program, um, 
some of us like would switch information. So I'm like still in touch with some of the people. Um, not so much, but yeah, I'm really, really, I loved that place. <laughs> yeah. When I was actually, um, after my mom died. So I, I think I said this last time, but my, my son was born like three days later. So it was, that was like real, it was crazy. The whole thing was crazy. Um, but I was, I feel like for a while I was like, okay. But then like actually a few months in, like one of my good friends sort of like was trying to get me help without telling me. Cause she's like, you really need to be in therapy, but didn't want to like offend me. She's a really good friend, you know? Um, but I ended up in therapy. I mean, I was in and out of therapy before then also, but like my therapist was for sure like God sent. And actually I started going to the, those catch support groups with Jessica. You did? Yeah. Oh man. And I don't know what I'm allowed to say, what I'm not allowed to say, but it was, I was there for a few months. It was super supportive and like, yeah. you know, and actually, did you read the book group? Cause that book we were actually, all reading. Actually, I'm literally in the middle of reading it right now. It's so good. I read it like I think in one Travis, like it was, but it's it. not super appropriate just for anyone who's listening. But like, it was really like it was just one of those books we all read and spoke. Yeah, about they definitely and, talk about some inappropriate things. Yeah, in the book, but um, yeah. it's fantastic. Yeah, it was definitely one of those things like part of the, the therapy, you know, like to read about someone else's, sh- like sharing. Yeah. Um, well, I really appreciate you sharing about this because I think that it's so helpful and I guess like we spoke about this a little bit last time that part of your brand is that like you're like a real person like you're a real mom you have real struggles and that's like part of who you are and what you're trying to accomplish on your page the other the other thing I wanted to sort of address is like what your thoughts are on oversharing like do you think that some people do sort of like overshare on Instagram or like on their social media or do you not like really believe in that because like people share what they need to share so I think that most people have good intentions when they're sharing. Um, I think, you know, some people might think, oh, she's sharing to get attention. I don't think that's the case with most people. I think there are a few things that you need to keep in mind when you're sharing that some people maybe forget sometimes, but three, a few things that I always keep in mind before I share anything is one, how will it affect my family um, immediately? Mm-hmm. My husband, my children, you know, their school. Mm-hmm. That's number one. Number two, how will it fa- how will it affect them in the long term? Meaning, like my kids are five or six. How will it affect them? High school, shidochim, you know, seminary and yeshiva, like all of that stuff, and. Then also number three is, does this like abide by my values? Mm -hmm. Um, You know, in terms of like modesty and things like that. My values, not anyone else's values. Right. Your values. Mm -hmm. What what are your values? Um, You know, um, Sorry, I was just diagnosed with severe ADHD and (laughs) I really see why I lose my train of thought very easily. Um, Oh, I understand. So what I was um, about the long term, you know, because people ask me sometimes, like, how can you be so open sharing about like your mental health and therapy Mm -hmm. and like you did this program and Mm -hmm. like now you're diagnosed with ADHD and like, how can you be and you're on medication and how can you be so open and do people ask you like people who know you really well or just followers like no not really just followers usually okay um I say you know also even with like Ozzy's diabetes my husband was so scared to tell me he had diabetes when we were dating it happened to be that the rabbi that macarved me also was a type 1 diabetic so I was like is that all you had to tell me? I thought he was going to tell me something horrific happened right. to him as a child. Right. But like, thank God, I didn't think it was a big deal. But like, if someone doesn't want to marry my child because he has type one diabetes, then I don't really want him marrying her anyway. Right. If someone doesn't want to marry into my family because 
their future mother-in-law got help that she needed and is a well-rounded, emotionally efficient, you know, and aware person who is probably more mentally healthy than most people in the world who aren't getting help. Again, I don't want them marrying into my family. And same goes with if a yeshiva or seminary wouldn't accept my child because of that, then that's not the right place for us anyway. Mm -hmm. Um, I just think there's nothing to be ashamed of when it comes to mental health. Now, I also happen to think that, you know, my level of modesty is, I'm a pretty sneeze lady. Um, and I'm proud of the level of sneeze that I'm able to hold by on Instagram. Um, am I shocked by some of the things that I see people, you know, doing or wearing? Yeah, sometimes, but okay, that's where they are. And that's not where I am, you know? Mm-hmm. Um, but that's sort of what I think about oversharing. I think just keep those things in mind and like be honest with mm-hmm. yourself, even if you really want to share something, but like, if it's not going to be, I'll give you an example. So say I don't like something that our school is doing. This is just an example. If I share that on social media, it's going to have immediate repercussions for my children. Like, not that the school would be like mean to them, but like, I don't want the school to think that I'm like fighting them on social media. Right. That's not the right thing to do. So right. have there been things that like, I had to keep my mouth shut about, about that? Yes, mm-hmm. and I do. It's right. just like, there's a line and you have to learn how to walk the line and not go over the line. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Like, uh, like I'm, I'm asking also like personally, because like for a while I had like this goal to post on Instagram every day. And I was, I think I was doing a pretty good job. It was actually during COVID. So I always tell people like I had to, my husband got three hours. So I got three hours. So like, it was, so it was like, if I had no clients that day, that helped me like to the accountability anyways. So recently I've had like a mental block to share. And part of it is like, how much do I want to share? You know what I mean? Obviously, every person is different. I'm not like saying my life and your life because that's just mm-hmm. different. But it definitely like has like every time I'm about to post or write a post, I'm like, why am I sharing this? And or like, let's say something would change. Like, because a lot of times I show like, let's say something feeding my kids. Like, because I that's what I do as a dietitian. I teach moms how to feed their kids and the division of responsibility and the feeding model, right? So like, let's say I remember I posted something about my Nehemia who's three now and he was eating like broccoli and cake at the same time, right? But like, what ha- we, you know what it's like in the afternoon, three o'clock, one thing's happening and three or two, another thing's happening. Right. And I have three kids and there's lots of things going on, you know? So like, I don't always post the follow-up, not because I don't want to, but because I just don't show my whole life on Instagram. So like for somebody who, who like you're an influencer, like your job is on Instagram. Do you find that to be hard? Like what you share, what you don't share, like what, like, I don't really know what, it, honestly, you would have to teach me like what influencers like do like to make money. So, I know like you do ads and stuff, but I'm saying the other stuff that you share. Sure. So like, yes and no. Um, you know, I'm fortunate because I've based my platform on just being me and just being real and giving that, you know, space and support to other people to also just be themselves and like hard things happen. So if I'm going through a hard time, I can say that and my audience respects that. Like I had a migraine yesterday, so I really didn't post so much and they respect that and that's okay. Um, I think... I think that I felt, I didn't fall, well, I didn't fall into this position, but I guess I kind of did. I'm very fortunate. Um, But sharing on Instagram for some reason was a creative outlet for me. Like it felt good. Um, And a lot of times, like when Ozzy was diagnosed with diabetes, we didn't share that on Instagram for three weeks. And it was horrible. 
Um, people knew that I was going through a really hard time. I was like super unavailable. Nobody knew why. And I just, I wanted to share. And as soon as I shared, it was like, Great. I felt like a total relief um, and a release even of like that built up tension. So for me, um, it's not so hard. And I can see like for other people that it probably is really hard, but I would just say like, don't over pressure yourself to share because then it makes it not fun for you anymore. Right. Like it's basically um, fun for you. Like the things that you share, it's like, yeah, I like it. And, you know, do I always want to like hop? I don't, if I don't want to hop on stories, like I don't, um, I usually do because it is my job and I have a responsibility to people. Um, but if something's really going on or I'm like really, you know, down, I don't share. And I usually say what's going on. Um, but I don't feel pressure. Mm -hmm. Um, and that's where, that's where people get caught up in social media is this pressure, right? Pressure to share the pressure to do this and look like that and have this and go mm -hmm. there. Right. Um, definitely. That's definitely true. I think once you lose that, like, listen, we just went to Disney and that was like our first family vacation we've ever been on. And I've been doing this for over five years. You know, we're not jet setting someplace else every other day. This is just my life. You know, I never felt a pressure to, you know, spend more money, buy more things, la, 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 la. Um, like you don't feel like it's affecting you like that, that like, just because other people are showing up on their vacations, like that's not your life. It's separate. No. And listen, do I know that if I would go on vacation more often that my engagement would be higher? Sure. It was super high, like high, way higher than normal when we were on vacation because people really like that stuff. But also right. it's just like a different from what I'm normally doing. Right. That's normal. Right. Um, no, I've also come into the stage of my life where I literally don't care. I call it free to be me. Um, and I just don't care what other people think, like could not care less. Um, and it is such a happy place. <laughs> it sounds like a great place. That it is sounds it's awesome. a wonderful place to be in. I wasn't there for a very long time, but it is magical. And maybe welcome, you could teach us, give us some I pointers. welcome everyone to come join me. There. <laughs> I'm happy to join you there. That's the, I find that really tough. Like, especially like, I wonder, do you ever get like, do people ever like write you mean, like, I know that not, I, I don't really get mean messages, but I know like, even when I would talk about like, things that were really hard for me, especially after, especially after my mom died, like with my kids, like everything just was hard, you know, yeah. like, um, so get it, getting them to school and people would be like, oh, it's not so sensitive for people who can't have kids. And I'm like, okay, so then don't watch my store. You oh, know? I hate that. I hate but, that. You know yeah. what the thing is, is that everybody has different struggles. I have friends right. who are struggling with infertility and that doesn't mean that I'm not allowed to have my own set of problems. It's right. really, it was really hard having Irish twins. It's still yeah. a little bit hard having Irish twins. Like I'm allowed to have a hard time with my kids. That is the challenge that Hashem has given me and they have a different challenge. Am I sensitive when I'm talking about it to other people, to certain people? Like, yes, but just because I have struggles doesn't mean that I'm not grateful right. for every blessing that I have. And it just because I struggle with my children doesn't mean that I don't know that they are like the ultimate bracha that I'll ever get in my life, you know? Right. Right. Um, and I think people forget that and people are just so quick to nitpick and like whatever and block, ignore. Right. And that's what you would but, do. Yeah. And that's what you do, like when it when it happens. Totally. Does it? Does it happen? Yeah, it does. So you I just used don't care. to get very affected when someone would write me like a long Megillah message, 
that like I've done something wrong. I used to be heart pounding, like would think about it for a really long time. Like ruminate. Yeah, don't care. When would you say that happened that you just like kind of let that go? I don't know. This is like really good stuff. Like you got to teach us how to do that. You know, you know, it's funny because can't teach it. Like, no, I don't know what I did. Uh I just stopped caring. And like, you can't just say that. Just just stop caring. (laughs) If only like you can't. I just I don't know. I just realized that other people's opinions of me really don't matter. If I know that I'm being a good person and living my life by the way that I want to live my life, and I know that I am a sensitive person. So before I put things out, I do think them over. I'm not just like, I mean, I have a little bit of a looser filter than some people, but, (laughs) but like, I'm not like a loose cannon Right. You know, I'm a sneeze woman, you know, who lives her life by Torah guidelines. And I think about the, the effect of my words on other people. And you're never going to make anyone, you're not going to make everyone happy ever. Right. Unf- until Mashiach comes, like this world is full of sinas chinam. Right. And I'm sorry for those people. I feel bad for them. Those people that just sit on Instagram and nitpick at other people. What a horrible life that must be. True. That's true. Like, be like me. I'm so happy. You know, I just, I don't care. Just don't care. If I see something I don't like, scroll on. Right. Right. You know? Totally. Be like Alyssa. It's a new hashtag. <laughs> <laughs> I, I think that, you know, what you're saying is like, Like I've heard people say who share a lot on Instagram that like, just like they wouldn't, like they might be having a bad day, but they'll show up in the supermarket, like with a smile. Well, I don't do that either. Cause I really have a hard time like masking my emotions, but some people are better at it. Um, I think that because social media is like, you know, like, let's say like back in the day, like five years ago, 10 years ago, there would never be like 40,000 people following you. Like, right. you know, so now like there's, it's magnified by like the amount of people that see your life. So you have, you really do have to develop thick skin to be like, no, it really doesn't matter. Like I would show up like this in real life also. So I'm just showing up like this on Instagram. You know what For I mean? For sure. Yeah. And it's like, you don't even know me. Right. Like but why? But they feel like they do. Yeah. Which is how I know I'm doing my job, which is great. But like the chutzpah I'm saying of some people to say the things that they say to someone that they really don't know. And would they say that to me in person? And if they would, they need, they have their own set of problems. (laughs) Right. Right. So you just have a really good like outlook on it that like, that's not on, that's not on you. That's on them. Listen, in my position, you have to, Mm -hmm. um, I think, I think that it's a great um, thing to adopt for anybody, but in my particular position, you have to have this, like, I don't even like to call it thick skin. It just like, it's like a glass wall almost. It does not permeate me. Mm -hmm. Um, The good messages, I let, like, I let them come to me Um, and they, you know, they validate why I do what I do. And um, they give my job more of a purpose. Um, but the bad stuff, it's just like, it's a shame. Mm -hmm. That's what it is. It's a shame that people talk like that to other people. (laughs) Totally. So could let's, let's spend a few minutes. I wanted to talk about like, um, specifically because you like talk about like, um, size inclusive or plus size modest fashion. I think that you are like such a good face for this, like in the firm world, because like for me, I, I am a dietitian, right. And I help people with intuitive eating. So I don't, I'm not a therapist. I don't really, my job isn't really like the body image piece, but I can't tell you how many times I feel stuck or 
have to refer a client more to like a body image therapist because yeah, people could make peace with food and they could stop dieting. But at the end of the day, most people are like, but I don't want to be fat, but I can't accept my body like this. Even if I could say to them like, well, were you happy or skinny or no, but still because of our culture, I guess, or because of the messages they got, it's just yeah, like so, one of the most painful things for them. Yeah. It's really, really hard. Um, I've actually come to a place, I actually have sort of, I'm trying to make better choices and take control of my health a little bit more. But I, I say to people, it's not, I'm happy with the way I look in my clothes now at this size, but I'm taking control of my health because I don't feel good. Mm -hmm. And exactly what you're saying. I think people often focus on the way they look versus the way they feel. Um, and I think, I think it goes hand in hand together where if you feel better, you will also feel better about the way you look. That's number one. But I also, I think it's important to find clothes that fit you and can make you feel beautiful at whatever size, which is why I like push so hard, um, you know, size inclusive brands and especially in the from stores when they decide to make plus size clothing, I'm like their biggest cheerleader because more women need to know about and have access to these clothing, um, to this clothing. Um, again, it's hard. It's like, it's hard. It's very hard to teach, which is probably why I'm not a body image therapist. Uh, <laughs> um, but just over time, I have come to peace with the way that my body is. I, it's been through a lot. It's done a lot of amazing things. Um, it continues to do amazing things. And I see pictures of myself and I look good, you know? Um, I think that looking at pictures of yourself when you feel good um, is really important. So if you've got a day when you are dressed up and you feel good in your outfit, like take pictures of yourself. Um, I also think that to, and I might get flack for saying this, but a certain, to a certain extent, if you fake it till you make it, um, if you just continue to say, you know, positive things about yourself out loud, um, and the way you look. I talk to myself in the mirror. Um, I'm like, yes, girl, you look good. Um, like continuing to do those things and also talking positively about your body in front of your children, which um, is like one of the most important things because we obviously don't want our children to have body image issues that we've struggled with our entire lives. Um, I think you slowly start to come into your own and, um, but I genuine, and this is like shallow, but I genuinely think that like dressing yourself appropriately and well for the way your body is can be one of the most helpful things you can do. Um, right. to help your body image. I just think that so many women don't know how to dress a larger body or feel that there aren't any options for a larger body, but it's not true. Mm -hmm. um, we're, we're making a comeback. We're making a movement. Mm -hmm. um, and does it need to be a better movement? Like, yeah, there's room to improve, but I wore a bit, I mean, I wore a bathing suit dress the other day and I looked good. Um, you did look really cute. I saw you on it. Thanks. <laughs> um, it's just like, it's practice almost. Right, right. Like you said, 
um well first of all I interviewed my friend Maria Marciano she's like a stylist and she talks about like body shapes and dressing your body they're dressing your body appropriately for your body shape now of course people will say like oh that's so not you know intuitive eating health at every size body positive because you could dress however you want. Yes, you could dress however you want. But if you want to feel better about your body, that is one tool some people utilize. Um, But when you were saying before about like feeling your feelings, right? And like the peak and riding the waves, I think that that's something that I teach and that therapists definitely teach in terms of like body image stuff, because you do have to accept that some, some days you feel worse in your body and some days you feel better in your body. But a lot of times it has nothing to do with your weight, but we- are kind of trained to believe that it is. It's like our body's fault and it's our weight's fault. So like sitting in that discomfort or noticing that discomfort. And then, like you said, it's, it's such a, it's a practice of like, you know, constantly speaking to yourself nicely, especially if there's years and years and years of like, you mentioned on the last podcast, people commenting about your weight. So you sort of have to like rewire your brain. Yeah. And the more times you say good things, that's another wire that is being rewired. Um, but there probably are so many bad wires that you're going to have to speak nicely about yourself a whole lot. Um, it's a process. Mm -hmm. It's actually interesting because I have, um, like young kids and like, I already see that like girls more than boys are sort of conditioned to be like, I'm so stupid. I'm going to do bad in my test. Like what? Like, where do you get that from? But it's like, yeah it's like a culture that we like put ourselves down, I guess, as a defense mechanism. So like that, those positive rewiring or wiring is like so important. Yeah. And like giving those positive wires over to our children also. Yeah, totally. Um, okay. This was amazing. Thank you so much for coming on again. I'm is there so any- glad we did it. Yeah. Any clearly we had time? enough to talk about. So yes, I love what you had to say. I think that what I said this last time, but I think what you're doing is so powerful. And people like definitely need that like authentic voice and they need a space where they can see like we all struggle, all humans struggle, and like this is normal. And there are people and tools out there to like help us and make us feel safe. And like you said before, about like if someone doesn't want to marry into your family because of that, that's just sad for them because right. you're taking really good care of yourself. Right. Uh, Okay. Thanks so much for for coming on. I'll put all your information in the show notes so people can find you. Okay, great. Thank you so much. Sure. Have a great day. You too. Okay. Bye.